Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation about project-based learning. My name is Jens Møller Pedersen and I'm Associate Professor at Aalborg University. So first let us take a look at what is problem-based learning. So in problem-based learning, the learning experience takes the starting point in a problem which can be a real-world problem. So the whole point is that you start out with a problem which can be a problem from science, a problem from society, a problem from a company and then you learn what it needs to solve that problem. That also means that you will need to acquire new knowledge and skills in order to solve the problem. So it's not just a way to, to test or experiment with skills that you have learned, for example, in a course. Um, you also get a chance not only to learn about a, a new topic or to learn about this knowledge, but you actually get real experience in using it. So it's the whole point that you're analyzing the problem, understanding the problem, learning what you need in order to solve it and then actually getting experience in how to do this. Uh, acquiring this new knowledge really is your job as a student. So there can be different ways that we as a university or professors can help you. But acquiring the knowledge is your job. Also often multiple skills are needed to be used, um, which requires communication and collaboration. And in the EPIC project, we are taking that one step further by actually bringing students from different study directions and countries together to work on solving problems. It is not easy, but it's a very good learning experience. So when we are studying engineering by group projects, there can be many different ways of doing it. So there can be many different components um, uh, of learning and many different uh, activities which support the learning. So group meetings can be one of them. Um, discussing problems and challenges, it can be brainstorms, it can be working in subgroups. So if there is a group of eight students, it might often make sense that they split into three or four groups who are then working on some of the smaller problems and they can, for example, present their solutions to the rest of the group. It can be discussions among everyone in the group in order to reach uh, good solutions, in order to try to understand the problem better. There can, of course, be disagreements. Usually disagreements, if they're handled correctly, are good because they demonstrate different point of views and understanding different point of views is an important part of solving a problem. Of course, it's also compromises. Sometimes you don't get the solution you really wanted, but it's really important to be able to find solutions where everyone can see them as part of that solution. Uh, presentations, presentation for, for each other, presentations for other people uh, is part of the work and of course also to have a life and a social life. Writing a report is also part of it but it's not the goal in itself to write a report it's just you can say the top of the iceberg very often the way to document the experience but there can also be other ways of making a uh, of reporting experience and communicating uh, your results there can be videos there can be posters there can be oral presentations so report writing is just one way of, you can say, reporting or documenting what, what you have learned. Of course, exam is also part of this learning experience. And don't forget the social activities. So when studying in the Nirmaya group projects, there are many different learning resources. Um, what is, uh, you can say, important is that it's a combination of active learning, of communication, organization and management these elements really have to be there. Uh, parts that I did not mention here is actually that there will also be online learning resources. So it's important when you are discussing something in the group or when you are trying to learn a new method, then you can actually also uh, use online resources, online courses, uh, MOOCs, go to lectures, speak to other people. So there are many different learning components that can support the group work. And that's actually also what you see here, where we have sketched a little bit more the EPIC approach. So it all starts with a problem. Usually in EPIC, it comes from a company. Then there is a product working group, which is trying to solve the problem, ending up with a product presentation, but also with a learning reflection report. And here I've tried to list many of the other components that goes into the, into the learning process. So there can be virtual meetings in the group, literature studies, sharing of documents, knowledge from modules, modules that we make available as part of the EPIC project, but also modules from other places and, for example, the MOOCs or just YouTube videos, Khan Academy. There are so many sources. 
uh, product management skills. Uh, there can be online collaboration platforms. Um, there can be individual tasks, individual assignments, which feed into the work of the group. There will be students with different backgrounds who can provide different perspectives. There can be feedback from the companies we're working with, but in fact also feedback from other companies um, or feedback from other organizations. Um, teamwork exercises to learn to work better in the group and to get to know each other better. And of course, supervisor meetings. And I, I would like to just extend the supervisor meetings to say that actually you can not only speak to your own supervisor, but there are many different experts available in in the epic consortium which uh, which you can reach out to so in epic we have four models for the joint student products that i just want to mention um, and you have to figure out which model describe your collaboration better but on the one hand we have the model one which is really starting out with a joint problem uh, probably being discussed in the seminar in hamburg and also later on uh, then the students are working more or less independently on the thesis or, or products that they have to deliver. And at the end, they collect the different perspectives and make the joint epic report. So they are, con they are, they are what is common is really um, understanding the problem together and then contributing with different components, but all the way through, of course, coordinating and learning from each other and ending up with a joint report. Um, then we have a slightly more collaborative model where there are actually aspects of joint work so where the students are really uh, working closely together and making parts, for example, joint parts of the report. And we can move even further where there is also a joint problem analysis, so the whole problem analysis is joint and still individual works, but with the possibility of adding joint works here and there. That can be across all the different products, or it can be just between some of them. And then there is the model four, where we have a really joint thesis. Of course, again, starting out with a joint problem, but then making a joint thesis or joint report across all the participating students. Um, another part that we are trying to integrate with EPIC is the sustainable development goals. And in the next slide, I will also argue why the sustainable development goals are really good for problem-based learning. So we can say that uh, the, the 17 sustainable development goals have been agreed among all the countries in the United Nations to try to achieve these goals by 2030. And they deal with everything from poverty, from social, um, solving social problems, to solving environmental problems, to making peace um, and having uh, strong institutions all over the world. So um, I will not go through all of them, but these are really good guidelines for making good student projects, I think. Um, the reason why I think these are so good for, for working on student projects is that it really gives a good motivation and it's possible to work on real world problems that actually makes a difference. And that's not just a report that is ending up in an exam and then everyone is forgetting about it, but we can actually make products and make solutions that create a difference for people in the world. That's a visible footprint, but especially for engineering, it's also something which can change the way we see engineering, that uh, engineering is not about solving equations. Engineering is really about solving problems uh, for people and helping people to get a better life. And the Sustainable Development Goals just gives a very good framework for doing that. Um, the picture here, I like it a lot. It's a, it's a product between Danish and Brazilian students, which is about distributing uh, food that is donated from parties. Uh, in Brazil, it's very common to donate, to, do, to donate food when you go to a party, but it's a challenge to make sure that the food which, which is donated also end up to those who need it the most. And uh, what they built here is a platform for, for communicating what food has been donated and to find out who is the best receiver of it. So it's really, um, you can say, a kind of Uber for food distribution. And here the students are explaining an NGO 
how the system works and as you can see it's really engaging both for the students but also for the people who would like to use it afterwards. Uh, continuing with the problem-based learning, so what is the problem? Uh, or rather, why should we be working with problems? Uh, because it's motivating. It's really nice to work with a, with a real-world problem where the solution makes a difference. Um, it's good because real-world problems are almost always interdisciplinary and complex, so it's not enough to understand a little, a little technical detail. You need to understand the context. It's a learning-centered process, so um, you play really the main role in your product. It's not the teacher playing the main role. Um, as I said before, and I can say it again, it's motivating. And then it emphasizes development of not only being able to solve equations or doing some small uh, technical things, but it's really also developing analytical, methodological, and transferable skills because you need to understand again uh, the context of the problem and you need to understand um, how your solution is being used and how other people are contributing also to solve the problem in the, in the bigger picture. Let's move on and talk about projects and not only problems. So more and more companies use project organization so it's good to be able to, to work in projects. Uh, much engineering work is actually performed as projects. And it also motivates the students and increases student activity because it's more active learning than, for example, lectures. And it secures a deeper learning in the subjects which are covered in the project because uh, you not only hear about something or read about something, but you actually get to do it and to, um, to use the tools and methods that you have learned about. Uh, it also improves documentation skills, and I would say it, it improves many skills also when it comes to uh, time planning, collaboration, and so on, which are really important uh, to know afterwards. I, I put a slide here with some important notes because very often problem-based and product-based are confused with each other. You will also see that PBL in some contexts mean problem-based, in others it means product-based. Um, of course they are different, but they can also be done at the same time. What is important to note here is that problem-based learning is really led by the problem. So um, very often products are made as, uh, let's say that students are following a course and then they have to apply the knowledge they learn in the course in a project. Then the project is really supporting the courses. When we are talking problem-based learning, then it's really the, the problem and the product which is the steering part and the courses are just supporting solving the problem and working with problem-based uh, product organized learning. Uh, so in problem-based learning it's led by the problem and not by causes and in problem-based learning it's really the problem that is steering the process and the causes are supporting the product work. So how to get started uh, in a good way? First of all the problem analysis is crucial so it's really important to get a good understanding of the problem before you start to solve it. Uh, that is not only a technical discipline, but also involves speaking with people um, and really get an understanding of uh, how it can be solved. Um, problem analysis usually involves both context and technical aspects. So it's about to understand the technologies behind it, but it's also about understanding the people, how it's going to be used to make sure that what you develop is really a solution and, and that the solution will actually work with, with the people and in the context it's supposed to work. Um, it's also very important that it's the problem and solution which determine the methods which are relevant to use. So it makes it very important to choose the right tools and methods and not just take the ones that you know from a course because it might not be the best ones. So it really requires the ability to, uh, to um, select and choose the right methods and tools. Um, and I would also say that some problems in groups of people with different backgrounds can be a challenge because different backgrounds also means often different languages. So you come from different domains, you see the world in different ways and you have to communicate and, and understand the views of others before you can really start to, uh, to get most out of that collaboration. So um, spending the time on understanding these different backgrounds and different perspectives is also something I would highly recommend. 
Um, finally, I would like to introduce the four-phase model of a product. So very often when talking about a product in industry or a student product, we will start with analysis, move on to design, uh, for designing the solution, uh, doing an implementation, so actually building the solution, and then end up testing it. When we're talking about an industrial product, we do everything uh, to the full extent. Um, very often we don't have time to do that in a student product, and it might also not be the activities which are supporting the learning process, the better. So uh, very often that would be uh, too broad a, a scope to be a good student project. So what is often done is that instead of narrowing everything down, which would make it too narrow and make it hard to make a good analysis, it's really based upon this uh, V model. So we start out analyzing the problem in full, then it might be necessary to choose only to design part of it, only to implement part of it, and only to test a small part of it. This means that what comes out at the end is not a fully um, implemented and tested product, but again, the reason for doing this project is not so much to build a final solution, but more for the learning process. I would add though that sometimes when, when working with a real problem, with a real company, you it's very important to be aware of what is expected at the end. And in some of the projects we have been doing with NGOs and the Sustainable Development Goals, it has also been important that, that the product in the end is actually something that is useful. So sometimes there is a trade-off between um, the learning objectives and the learning goals on one hand, and on the other hand, um, on the uh, expected outcome and on making the outcome useful, which is also part of the motivating factor. So it's important to be aware of this trade-off and to uh, to think about that when scoping the product from the beginning. And that was the finish of part one with introduction to problem-based learning. Thank you very much for listening. And once again, thank you for following the EPIC project.